Hi, I'm Cynthia Heiner, and today I want to talk to you about reevaluating how to teach and learn science at universities. I really want to stress the learning because teaching and learning are really two sides of the same coin. Just so you have a little background of me, I'm trained as a physicist, an experimental physicist, and now I'm doing physics education research. So I've really come to bring the content of my physics into an educational setting and sort of looked into how to use my research skills to make better physics teaching and learning. What I want to do is give a short motivation as to why we should reconsider how we teach science at universities based on recent research. Then I want to briefly introduce one of these research-based instructional strategies known as peer instruction or think-pair-share. And then I'm going to describe the Carl Wyman Science Education Initiative project and talk about the different roles within that project as well as its impact. And then I'll give a short summary of what I've talked about. So there's been a lot of research in education over the years, particularly in primary and secondary level. But what we're looking at now in the last two decades are really the undergraduate level at university and in science classrooms, not in the lab setting, not sort of having them just read something and go through it, but really what's going on in the classroom. So that's sort of the experimental side. And you have classrooms that can range from 20 students to 200 to 400 students. We want to see what's happening in those classrooms. But that's just one part of the puzzle. What we also have is, in the, with the technology we have now, we can do brain imaging. We can actually see neurons that are being fired while learning is taking place. What's going on with the memory? That's one aspect. And what you also have is this cognitive psychology has come up where you can look into how are we priming ourselves for learning? What's our motivation for learning? These different research areas may seem separate, but actually they come together to form this coherent picture into how we learn. And we want to use these methods and these findings to m improve our learning, particularly in the science classes. Some of the things that have come out from this are some specific components of effective teaching and learning. So one thing is you have to connect with your prior thinking. So we have to Check, we can't do that for our students. Our students have that thinking. For instance, in physics, which is where I come from, you might have a model to explain something in your head, and now you're being taught in the physics class a new model, and you might just accept that. Or what we can try to do is connect it to their previous model. Where did their model end and could no longer describe the phenomena, and where do they now need this new model to describe what they see? Where does it come into play? It's not just about the content that we have to connect with their prior knowledge, but also they have prior knowledge into how they learn. They've been trained at school, and again with foreign students, so I was working at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver where they have a very large Asian population. They have a different primary schooling than we do sometimes in the West, so they have a different idea of what it means to learn and to study. So we need to connect with both of those ideas with the students, bring them on board into why we're doing these new methods, and then also connect it with their content knowledge. So that's sort of the first step. The next thing is the motivation. That might sound like something very personal, but it's actually not. The instructors can do a lot to create motivation in their students, to promote motivation. So motivation is ideally that the subject is interesting. So if you're teaching biology students in a physics classroom, for instance, you may want to use examples from the biological system. That would be one thing that may increase the interest of the students. That's sort of context-rich problems. But you also want to make it clear to the students how it's useful to them, how it's useful and relevant in their career, in their progress, and at a low level, how is it relevant to their grades? Students ask, is this going to be on the exam? So an exam can be something that trains them to know to what they should learn, but you can expand that. It doesn't have to just be an exam. It can be activities you have in the lecture that are relevant and can be considered part of their grade that they will then engage with. So that you create that motivation in different ways. Also, within that motivation is the sense of mastery. So if a student feels that there's this giant mountain and they're never going to get to the top, it's very easy to give up, to have an excuse to say, oh, I can't do that. How many people have you ever heard say, I can't do history? But people say, I can't do math, I can't do physics. Well, it doesn't really make sense. You need to give them the steps that they see where can they get to and that they'll be able to get to that mastery. If they think they'll never have a chance, it's a perfect excuse to not even try. So these things come together. That's sort of one side of the coin. Now the other side is we want to apply what we know about memory and sort of brain knowledge. So just as a small example, 
you have sort of this idea of chunking. So if I'm memorizing a phone number, I have to memorize seven individual digits. But if I know that the first three digits are an area code, I can remember that as one chunk of information plus four individual digits. So by having that and knowing how much can, how much memory can a student sort of allocate to new information at any one time, we have incorporate that into our lecture. So just pouring information in does not mean the student could pour it right back out. So we have to think about what can they accomplish. And again, when you connect it with their prior thinking, you actually embed it deeper in their learning. So this is another reason to connect these new facts, and that helps them build the memory. And that leads to the next point, which is explicit practice of expert thinking. So the experts might know this is an area code or this is a certain structure, whereas a novice might not see that. And so it's important for us to help them see the structures that could help them optimize their sort of memory and their thinking and connecting it to their prior knowledge. So we need to not only model that as experts, but explicitly give them the opportunity to practice it. And that all comes back to timely and specific feedback. And a lot of times in our lectures, we're getting to be 20 students, again, 200, 400 students. You might think the only feedback is an exam, which is usually too little, too late. And that's not true. We can actually, we know that the best learning is a one-on-one -on -one situation. And even though we don't have that situation, that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for it. And by using some of these technologies and these research-based methods, you can have more often frequent, uh, more frequent feedback and you can have more specific feedback and that each student gets their own feedback based on their answers to certain questions. So this is sort of the idea that we want to get all of these features into the, the lecture or at least into the studies of st science students on a regular basis. So at the end of this essentially the message is the learning is in the doing. I can't do the learning for them. I can provide them with it. So as I mentioned, you have to also have the students on board. I need to talk about their previous ideas of learning. So my first day of classes, I use this exact same slide as do many of my colleagues to really have a very transparent message to the students as to what I expect of them. So what I show them is this picture here where you see um, the guy playing baseball and a guy sitting on the couch. And the question is, is he getting any better at baseball, the guy on the couch? And inevitably, there'll be one student who says, yeah, because he now knows the stats and he knows what's going to happen with the plays. And I can say, yes, so some knowledge you can get from watching. But can you throw the ball better? Can you hit the ball better? Can you catch the ball better? No, because you didn't do it. And the idea behind a science education is not that you can follow it. It's that you can do it. You can make new problems that don't have answers. You can solve those. So the idea is we want to get that clear to the students. So if I'm giving a lecture, yes, there is some amount that may be transferred to the student, but it is not efficient and it's not effective. And the idea is we need to have the students really rise up to that. Another analogy I like to use very often is also in music. If I was a music teacher and came and played Chopin for you beautifully and then left and said, great, you'll do that next week, you'd be like, that's the worst music class I've ever had. I need to watch you struggle through playing and notice that your fingers are in the wrong place or you're making the same mistake, and that's going to help you. And that's what we need to provide these students. Um, in addition to that, what's very often overlooked in science is it's looked, we think about, um, and also engineering and math, we think about problem solving and getting through these homework problems, and I'm not trying to underestimate that skill, but once you move past that, once you have your degree and work into the workforce or academia, either one, you're working in groups, you're giving presentations, you're applying for research grants, you're applying to get, um, to get the contract for a job. So you're going to have to work with people. And if you can't convince someone you're right, it's the same as if you're wrong. And that is something that makes students wake up. It's something they haven't heard. And we need to have them practice those skills now while we still have them as students. Um, particularly in, again, other cultures where it's very competitive to get into schools, they see their peers as people they have to knock down. And the idea is, no, we actually need to learn from them and work together as a group. And if you, again, if you can't convince someone that you're right, then it's really the same as if you're wrong, because you're not going to get that grant. You're not going to get what you need. So with that in mind, I just want to discuss one typical um, research-based strategy, just so you have a feeling. So this one I'm going to talk about today is peer instruction. So what peer instruction is, is you have the instructor poses a multiple choice question. It doesn't have to be multiple choice. There are other ways of adapting it, but this is the most basic. So I'm just going to use that as the example. The students should think about the question on their own. And then the students should vote. 
This is really key. This comes into that cognitive psychology part of the triangle. The students, when you vote, you are now intrinsically, you're inherently more interested in the outcome of that vote. So everyone has that thing, if you watch maybe a TV show where they have multiple choice questions, and you're like, oh, it's A or B, and they tell you it's B, you're like, yeah, I thought it was B. No, you didn't. You didn't know. You weren't sure if it was A or B. Once you commit to an answer, you're much more interested in what the outcome is. And you want to also see is the outcome based on what you were thinking, or were you a lucky guess? So you need them to vote. You can vote with electronics. You can, there are apps, some paid, some unpaid you can use. Um, at University of British Columbia, we actually used a small device that just had a voting uh, process, and that was it, um, because we didn't want the students to get too distracted with their cell phones. Um, but we've also used really basic paper voting cards. So you, it doesn't really matter. The key is that they vote. And at that point is when the peer instruction may or may not happen. So ideally, I have a posted a question with five choices, and there's a spread over all five choices. Brilliant. This shows me the students have a lot to learn. They have a lot of potential to talk about. And they've all thought about the question on their own, so they're ready to have conversations about that material with these students around them. And also, it gets me feedback into what are they thinking. I can walk around and actually listen to their conversations. So that's the peer instruction part. Now, I say it may happen. If I have a bad question, because you're trying things out, you're not always sure, and 80% get it right, there's not much potential for learning on that question. So as an instructor, I would mark that next year, maybe don't even have that question or reevaluate that question. Now, all of this requires more effort from the students. They have to do things during the lecture. They can't just sit back. But it also re-engages them. It's sort of, if they kind of faded for 10 minutes, it kind of forces them back in. It forces them at that moment to be like, I kind of followed along, but now that I have to answer this question, I'm not sure. So it forces them to get that individual feedback right then. That's a personal thing for everyone in the classroom. And not only that, they actually get now also feedback from the other students around them. A lot of times you sit there alone and you, you think you're the only one who didn't understand. But now you realize, wow, there's a big distribution of people voting different things. So I'm not alone in that I'm confused in this topic. And that helps again with the community. And so that's sort of the, the idea behind this sort of active learning. So the students in this process also, not only do they learn the content, but they learn how to practice to think and communicate like scientists. This is an, uh, an aspect that we don't always have so centrally in the typical curriculum. And this is something that is needed once they leave university. And the instructors benefit because they really see what do students know and don't know? And then the instructor can choose what to do that information. So ideally, the instructor notices that they're struggling and they maybe assign a new homework question to help the students or they re themselves reflect about how they could teach that better. And that's great about the feedback and also timely and specific. What's also really good about this is some people might already start thinking that sounds idealistic, but what we see is routinely that about 80% and sometimes more, in my class it was as high as 90, the students regularly talked with their neighbor about the subject matter, about physics, when given this opportunity to do so. This may be even more rewarding for students that are English as a second language students because it forces them to, again, use their English skills to practice communicating their science skills, as well as for underrepresented students. For instance, women in a very large male-dominated class like physics are maybe not so often going to raise their hand in front of the instructor, in front of everyone to ask a question. And in these small talks, it gives them the opportunity to go through their own knowledge. And we all know the best way to learn is by teaching. Um, this, but this peer instruction also requires some more support for the instructors. The instructors have to identify key misconceptions and concepts that they would need to teach. They have to create multiple, que multiple choice questions, um, and they have to facilitate this all in the classroom. Well, these are skills that not every instructor has because they have not been trained in it either. And that's where we come into the Carl Wyman Science Education Initiative.